Welcome to week seven. We have now crossed the threshold into the first millennium and the rest of the course is going to be focused on this period of time between uh, 1000 BC and 323 BC, uh, which is where we find the, the, the kind of real history of ancient Israel and Judah. This week, we're going to take a break from Mark Vandermerup's textbooks and deep dive into a section of uh, Miller and Hayes' book, A History of Ancient Israel and Judah, which <clears throat> uh, among the various uh, histories of ancient Israel that have been written, Miller and Hayes is somewhere in the middle. And if you're unfamiliar with uh, the, the, the kind of scholarship on ancient Israelite history and historiography, uh, over the course of the past several decades, there has kind of been a, a bifurcation of scholars into uh, one of three camps. So you have your middle ground uh, scholars, and then you have what are pejoratively called maximalists and minimalists. And maximalists operate under an assumption of uh, or, a, or a hermeneutic of trust with regard to the biblical text. And minimalists operate uh, kind of in, in light of a, a hermeneutic of suspicion, um, meaning the mas maximalists seem to take uh, the Old Testament at face value unless there's incontrovertible evidence uh, to the contrary, whereas minimalists uh, attend to doubt the veracity of the biblical text and attempt to reconstruct ancient Israelite history without the biblical text or in, in, in significant suspicion of the of biblical text unless there's incontrovertible evidence to the contrary, meaning some type of archaeological discovery that proves the existence of a particular person. Um, and this obviously gets into uh, the discussion this week, because uh, as you read about the, the reigns of Saul through Solomon in Miller and Hayes's book, you will notice very quickly that there is very, very little, uh, really no, direct archaeological evidence for the existence of these three individuals, or, or direct, I should say, historical evidence. By historical, I mean textual evidence. There's no text in the 10th century or the early 9th century, uh, or sorry, the, <clears throat> yeah, the 11th century, uh, uh, 10th century, and then, and then early 9th century, uh, mentioning Saul, David, or Solomon. None. The earliest mention we get is in the Tel Dan Stella, uh, which you'll read about and then watch a video about this week, uh, and that dates to several hundred years after the reign of David. Um, and this mentions the, the Beit David, the, the uh, family of David, the lineage of David, not necessarily David as a historical person. Um, and so, you know, one could easily look at the data around the 10th century and say that Saul, David, and Solomon didn't exist. Um, and this really kind of gets to our understanding of history and how we reconstruct history. Uh, <clears throat> now, one thing you'll notice is that in Miller and Hayes' book, they do begin Israelite history with uh, these characters, uh, Saul, David, and Solomon. Um, other uh, scholars, minimalists, might not begin a history of ancient Israel until the reign of Omri, or the, the Omride dynasty, because that's where we do find historical evidence, meaning textual evidence, and significant archaeological evidence to support a strong kingdom uh, led, led by the Om Omride dynasty uh, that has significant interaction with other ancient Near Eastern polities. Judah, however, is a, big, is a, is a, is a, is a bigger difference. Um, and uh, case in point, uh, after Solomon's reign, or we were, where we would date Solomon's reign, an Egyptian pharaoh marches through Canaan, and he mentions uh, various cities. One city he does not mention is Jerusalem. Now, why this pharaoh would have avoided Jerusalem, one can only speculate, or why he doesn't mention Jerusalem, one can only speculate. Uh, but one possibility is Jerusalem wasn't a significant city. It was in the hill country of Judah. Maybe it was very, very small, did not have any significant political advantage, to conquer, uh, or that the state of Judah just really wasn't that important, which would contrast with uh, one way you could read the biblical text and that Jerusalem was the, the capital of this important uh, uh, nation, Judah. Um, but why this Pharaoh would, would neglect mentioning Judah, it's hard to say. Uh, but that's how 
you know, one, that's one issue and in, in one way this would play out. Now, one would, uh, some scholars on the minimalist camp would really say that, that Judah height or Ju Judean history uh, doesn't really begin, the kingdom of Judah doesn't really begin until after the fall of the northern kingdom. When you, you see uh, a kingship develop there in Jerusalem, you see a number, number of northerners flee, flee down to the south into Judah, and uh, this kind of state taking over and becoming more important and powerful. Um, as I mentioned, as we look at Saul and David, or Saul, David, and Solomon, there's no historical evidence, meaning textual evidence, of these three individuals. All we have are circumstantial evidence, meaning the biblical text, which is not a primary source uh, for history. We have archaeological evidence, and we have some sociological evidence. Um, and the, archaeological, the strongest archaeological evidence that we have is uh, uh, a number of uh, archaeological sites at, at places like Megiddo, Hatzor, and Gezer, as well as some archaeological evidence in the south related to mining. And uh, at, at, at Gezer, Hatzor, and uh, uh, Megiddo, you have what are called Solomon's Gates. And I encourage you just to Google Solomon's Gates. You have these six uh, uh, chambered gates that uh, are very similarly constructed at these three sites and elsewhere actually in Canaan. Um, and some archaeologists have attempted to, to argue that these are evidence of a strong administration around the time of Solomon. Uh, and so there was an administration that had these gates built for the purposes of defense, uh, and as well as city walls and things like that. And that suggests that there was a strong administration capable of doing that. Uh, you don't generally find these tendencies of having three important cities built in the same way or have similar ar archaeological structures without an administration capable of carrying that out, planning it, paying for it, etc. Um, and so one of the issues that we get to uh, in terms of sociologically supporting the, king the existence of the kingdoms is the existence of writing. Now, uh, alphabetic writing is developed around the 18th century BC uh, in Egypt. However, it's not used significantly um, until about 1000 BC, and this is used throughout Canaan. Uh, it's, it's the basis for Phoenician and Hebrew and Moabite and Ammonite uh, and Aramaic. Um, and so this, uh, this uh, alphabetic writing that we find, um, that really the question is, was there an administration strong enough to support a scribal culture, to support uh, the building and the, the, the architectural development of certain, certain places, and that could have run a, uh, a, a small nation uh, from, you know, as the Bible says, from Dan to... Uh, from Dan in the north to the very south end uh, to Beersheba. Um, and so this is the question, you know, was there a united kingdom under David and Solomon? It's very hard to prove that it happened. Were Saul and David kings or were they more like chieftains or warlords? Another issue that comes up that we won't really get to in this class is the character of David. And if, you know, we, we would cover this in an OT 500 course. Um, you know, David is not necessarily the, the most uh, uh, best the best depicted person in the Old Testament. He has a lot of lot a lot of flaws, and he seems to act more like a warlord at times than anything else. Another question that comes up if if Saul and David were historical figures is uh, was David's rise to be king uh, succession or usurpation? Uh, again, another issue that it's kind of hard to determine historically but one needs to read closely and kind of read between the lines in a number of ways as they read the Old Testament. Um, we'll learn about early Canaanite literature in this, in this week as well. You'll read an article about uh, this by Simon Parker. You'll also read the Tel Dan and Meshastella. Uh, you, the re I think you read the Meshastella last week in your comparative assignment. Um, and you'll also read some stuff on temple building from a literary perspective as well as an archaeological and iconographic perspective. And one question, again, is could Solomon, did Solomon have the administrative structure to build such a thing like the first temple? Now, we don't have access to the first temple. It's under the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. No one can dig archaeologically there because 
Right now, it is the third holiest site in all of Islam. There's a lot of political issues, a lot of political tension there with that place. Uh, and so the best that archaeologists can do is dig the refuse around the Temple Mount. And they've uncovered a number of things like cylinder seals and stamp seals and things like that, which have helped to support uh, the idea that there was a temple here. Um, and we certainly have uh, evidence of a second temple, or what we, what we would call the second temple, but we, it's, a very, it's impossible at this point for archaeologists to dig under the Temple Mount to find the first temple. Um, <clears throat> so this is what this week is going to focus on. It's going to focus on the period of the early monarchy or where the period is, or where the early monarchy is placed. And I hope it gives you some historical insight into the culture, the context, and things like that of this early important period. Now, one of the reasons why I didn't give a week six wrap up is I've been asked by a few students to uh, provide some ministry applications for the material that we are talking about in the course, and I'm happy to do so. Um, one of the things that I think, uh, I'll give really three things uh, in this week's just short, you know, minute for ministry, if we'll call it, uh, that I think uh, come out of the course that you can apply. One of these is in terms of Bible studies. So, you know, a lot of Bible studies like to provide character profiles uh, by their Bible studies based on Joseph and Joshua and Moses and, and David and things like that. Um, most of the time I find things like this a little flattening, as that they flatten the characters and they make them just about one thing. David is an, is an example. Here's an uh, individual who there is a plethora of Bible studies and and uh, devotions and things like that about. And maybe David was the sweet psalmist of Israel, uh, as he's called in, in 2 Samuel. Um, but for all the psalms that he is purported to have written, uh, here is also an individual who uh, uh, killed or had killed Uriah. He uh, committed adultery with uh, his soldier's wife, got her pregnant. He was also... Uh, you know, involved in uh, what the biblical text is, is very adamant that David was always um, uh, and somehow not involved in the deaths of a number of individuals. He neglected uh, to take action when his daughter was raped. He neglected to take action when his son was killed by his other son. Um, you know, and then he's basically almost overthrown and usurped by one of his children. Uh he seems to be pretty pragmatic in terms of relationships and uh, ultimately ends in demise. So I, you know, I would just question or I would provide encouragement to be, more, to be very critical in the types of character studies that we do in the Old Testament. Um, and even uh, some of the things we do are based on mistranslation or misunderstanding. That is, in the Old Testament there is this phrase, David was a man after God's own heart. Uh, and often this is kind of taken as a sentimental uh, issue. Sentimentally, David somehow reflected God's qualities and things like that. I don't know God to be an adulterer or a murderer. Uh, <clears throat> and so I would encourage you to kind of reflect on this phrase, a man after God's own heart. And I would give you a parallel uh, that I think, and, and many scholars would say, actually, I don't think any scholar would disagree with this at all. Uh, there is a Akkadian phrase, Shah Libby Shu, which is almost an exact cognate phrase to um, Ish Livo, a man after his, his heart. Uh, and the Akkadian phrase relates to, it, it describes uh, the way that a king, an Assyrian king, would describe a ruler whom he set in place. And it means a person whom I chose. The biblical phrase means the exact same thing. It does not mean a uh, man uh, who reflects God's character or heart. That's not what the phrase means when it refers to David. What it means is that David is a person who God chose rather than a person whom the people chose, like Saul. If you read the story of Saul, the people choose Saul. God doesn't choose Saul. God chooses, chooses David. So David is a person whom God chose. Now, why he chose David, uh, you know, one can, one can speculate uh, but it certainly doesn't mean somebody who reflects the character of God. Uh, anyway, so that's, that's just a, a, an encouragement to be very critical about the type of character studies that we do based on biblical characters. Um, another thing that studying the ancient Near East and studying the text in depth and in comparison with ancient Near Eastern texts is I think it reduces the chance for what's called bibliolatry. 
idolatry of the Bible. Obviously, you know, Christianity is a, 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 a religion of the book. That is, uh, the scripture is taken very seriously. It's authoritative, however one defines that. It's, we believe it's inspired by God. Uh, but it's not to be worshipped. Um, now, certainly there is a divine and human aspect in scripture. Just like Jesus is incarnate, both human and divine, scripture, the word of God, is incarnate, both human and divine. And, the, and preaching is incarnate, both human and divine. Um, but we don't worship scripture. However, there is a tendency to almost put scripture on, on a pedestal in the sense that you can't question it, you can't criticize it, you can't, uh, um, you can't doubt it for, for an instance, um, almost to the extent where scripture itself takes the place of Jesus. But, but that's not how it's meant to be. It's inspired, it's meant to guide us to God. It's meant to guide us into fuller knowledge of God. But it's not meant to replace Jesus as the worship, the, the, the object of our worship. Another uh, uh, issue that I would discuss with regard to uh, studying this material is there's a, there's a book out that recently published by an, uh, a scholar named Brent Strawn, and the book is called The Old Testament is Dying. And he makes the case that just like a language goes through, uh, a, 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 through a period of uh, emergence uh, and then ultimately decline and death, that, that the Old Testament as a language is in this period of, of dying. It's being lost in our political discourse and even in Christian discourse. Think about how many sermons you hear about the Old Testament or uh, you know, how many Bible studies or Sunday school lessons or you know, things like that. Now maybe your tradition does value the Old Testament, many do, but there's very few lectionary readings from the Old Testament. There's very few sermons preached on the Old Testament uh, based on Brent Strawn's study. And this is very, very different than early America or particularly in, in the UK where the Bible was used to teach literacy for, uh, for children. Um, so we live in a new era where uh, interest is dying. And I think that studying the ancient Near East and bringing the larger historical and socio-historical, uh, socio-cultural and historical context into people's understanding of the Bible can help revive the life of the Old Testament in the church. Uh, people find, and I hope you're finding, that the Bible uh, is more than meets the eye. There's much more there. There, It's deeper than we often realize. It's more interesting as you learn about the historical and sociocultural context around it. It's not a flat text. And reading it in translation and reading only page deep makes it seem like it's a flat text, like it doesn't have anything interesting to say. Reading it in its ancient Near Eastern context and understanding the mess, the political and historic, the political and social message that Scripture has, provides a, 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 an avenue for the text to say something today to us in our context. That the Bible is a political document, uh, and it has something to say to us today in our own political context. The depth of reading is enhanced. But the depth of reading is like the depth of a relationship. Uh, you know, people that don't have meaningful relationships are shallow, often tend to be very shallow. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to say that a Christian who uh, doesn't read the Bible very much is somehow a shallow Christian. But your, your, your relationship with God and just your development as a person, a, a follower of Christ, is going deepen as you... Uh, as you study and understand the Bible more and more. And you're going to do that through accessing it in its, in its historical context. Uh, you know, it, so I hope that provides some kind of insight into maybe some three touch points uh, of how you know, studying this stuff can enhance what we do personally and as, and as ministers. And I hope to, if you have, please, if you have any specific questions, let me know, and I would love to address those, and I'll work to providing some insight into connections with ministry as the course goes on. Now, let me touch lastly on the papers. I've received some emails from students with regard to your paper topic. Please send me a brief uh, profile of what you want to do on your final paper. And I address some resources, uh, uh, issues of resources as well. I'm happy to point you to... 
any particular profitable resources that, that I can. I can't do the research for you. I can't build your bibliography for you for this paper. But Hayes' book is a good starting point. And uh, Context of Scripture, which is available online, has a plethora of comparable, uh, comparative texts that you can use uh, to research your paper. And then, of course, there's Fuller's uh, very uh, uh, generous and very vast online database. So if you have any questions, please let me know. I look forward to reading all of your proposals for your papers. And it really is just a short note describing the passages or texts or images that you want to compare to a biblical text. And then give me an idea for you know, what your specific focus for this paper is going to be, what you want to get out of it. And I'll give you some feedback. If you have any questions, please let me know. Have a great week.